Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third of our Tomorrow Talks, an ongoing series in which ASU students interact with some of our best public intellectuals. The series is the brainchild of Kyle Jensen, the visionary director of our writing program. Tomorrow Talks are a student engagement initiative led by the Division of Humanities and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at ASU and hosted by ASU's Department of English in partnership with the School of Social Transformation, the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, and Macmillan Publishers. Additional assistance is provided by ASU Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and School of Civic and Economic Thought in Leadership. As you can see, it takes a lot of partners to make something that is so good. And tonight is very good indeed. We feature Ayanna Thompson in conversation with Lisa Anderson. Let me start by saying it is a pleasure to be able to introduce not only a brilliant scholar, but a good friend. Um, recently, I was able to talk a little bit about Ayana's life, career, and impact as part of her becoming a Regents Professor, the highest honor that we give to Arizona faculty across our system. And just in reflecting on it, I'll say that few people that I know and have met have had such a profoundly good impact upon so many, not just across the United States, but internationally, uh, as she has changed the terms by which we engage with the past. But to give you a few facts of her life, Ayanna Thompson is a Regents Professor of English and Director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. She's the author of Blackface, just out from Bloomsbury, which we are celebrating tonight, Shakespeare in the Theater, Peter Sellers, Teaching Shakespeare with a Purpose, a student-centered approach, co-authored with Laura Turchi, Passing Strange, Shakespeare, Race in Contemporary America, and Performing Race and Torture on the Early Modern Stage. She wrote the new introduction for the revised Arden Three Othello and is the editor of the just out Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare and Race, a terrific book that you want to read as well as the editor of many other books. She's currently collaborating with Curtis Perry on the Arden Four edition of Titus Andronicus. In 2021, Thompson was appointed to the board of trustees of the Royal Shakespeare Company. And in 2020, she became a Shakespeare scholar in residence at the Public Theater in New York. She was the 2018 to 19 president of the Shakespeare Association of America. I could go on, in fact, I could go on all night, but let me reduce this to one short sentence. Ayanna Thompson is amazing. Lisa Anderson will lead our conversation tonight. Professor Anderson is an Associate Professor of Women and Gender Studies and African American Studies and Deputy Director in the School of Social Transformation at ASU. She received her bachelor's from Mount Holyoke College, master's from Smith College, and doctorate in theater history and criticism from the University of Washington. Her current research interests include the performance of gender, race, gender, and sexuality in popular culture, and feminist semiotics and phenomenology. Her book, Black Feminism in Contemporary Drama, was published by University of Illinois Press in 2008. She has recently complete, completed a book entitled Negotiating Hollywood on Black Woman, Power and Representation in Television, and her current projects include a co-authored book on the intersections of race, gender, and sexuality and phenomenology, as well as a collaborative study on women in the music industry. Um, it's really an honor to have two such incredible intellectuals with us tonight and to be able to listen in as they have a conversation and then turn it over to our students. So over to you, Ayana and Lisa. Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Ayana, how are you? I'm so happy to get to talk to you. <laughs> as am I. I, I, I. First, I wanna start off by saying, I loved this book. It made me <laughs> so happy. Thank you so much because, um, I feel like I wrote it in such a furor, like it was written very quickly right around um, the murder of George Floyd. 
And I couldn't tell if I was making any sense or not. <laughs> and I sent it off. And I was so shocked when the publisher was like, yeah, okay, we're rushing it to print. <laughs> well, I can certainly see why. So I, I have so many points. There are so many things that resonated with me. Um, you know, as, as you know, um, I have interest in blackface and black performance. And in fact, I was, I was remembering that the very first article I ever published was actually on blackface minstrelsy. So this was just like serendipitous. This was perfect. So, um, uh, so in, in thinking about blackface, maybe you could tell, tell us a little bit about the, the thing that other than George Floyd and all of the, the unrest that happened, the other thing that sort of was the impetus for you to think about blackface and to sort of engage in this project. Right. So actually <laughs> the book that I wanted to write, but I still haven't written is about the way that black actors are not frequently labeled as virtuosos mm -hmm. and how often virtuosity is tied with being Protean, which is a shape-shifting uh, figure. Mm -hmm. And white actors who are lauded are frequently called virtuosos because of their ability to shape-shift into different roles. And what I, in thinking through that, what I realized was part of what was tied to virtuosity was an ability to play other races, something that has not been available to actors of color. And so then I was like, okay, okay, okay. I have to kind of walk back from that, from making that argument and make a kind of longer historical argument about where blackface started and why it's still so prevalent in the 21st century. So that was really the impetus for the book. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit. Um, one of the things that struck me in reading it was uh, the, the claim that a lot of people make about their their um, their use of blackface, particularly in contemporary times, um, is that it is is celebratory or honoring um, um, versus my sort of understanding or where where I come from and, and sort of understanding of with as a, its origins in a sort of mocking of blackness, mm -hmm. and so. The, you know, the original white actors who created Blackface Minstrelsy. So I know that your book goes back even further in terms of people blacking up and, and racial uh, racial character or putting on racial characters. Um, but the, the Blackface Minstrel Show that, that it was, became extremely popular in the United States um, was really about comedy. It was about making audiences laugh and it was laughing at blackness. Mm -hmm. um, so... I was sort of meant to gauge about the the so the difference between something that might be celebratory and something that's mocking, and how people can sort of <laughs> hold both of those at the same time. Right, and so I'm thinking, for example, about the current governor of Virginia, Ralph Northam, um, who in the 1980s uh, performed in blackface at least once, and he seems to think maybe more than once, but he can't exactly remember. Um, he said that uh, he remembered blacking up to do a dance uh, to Michael Jackson and that he had really worked hard to learn how to moonwalk and that he had gotten a glove and that he had gotten a hat and that he had put on shoe polish <laughs> and like won this dance contest. Um, and when asked about this, everyone assumed he was going to resign as governor when this came out. He was like, but I was celebrating Michael Jackson. I loved him. I had no idea this was harmful. And that's the, the part where you're like, you did, I don't understand. How did you not know this is harmful? But also he claimed not to know the history of blackface minstrelsy, that he had to be taught that as a, a he's a doctor and a governor of a state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do think um, to the originators of blackface minstrelsy as a performance tradition also claimed that they were celebrating black people. So T.D. Rice claimed that he watched an older black uh, enslaved person 
um, in a barn singing and dancing in a kind of hobbled way on a on broken legs, basically. And that his creation of Jim Crow and jumping Jim Crow uh, was actually a kind of way of celebrating this uh, enslaved person that he had witnessed. So he didn't initially say that it was derogatory. He, he framed it as celebratory and imitating. And so I think that's the loop that we're stuck in, that white, white people who engage in blackface performances often say, I'm celebrating, uh, but, but also what underlies it is this assumption that uh, performing blackness is a white property, that white people are allowed to cross racial lines in performances because in their hearts, they're innocent and pure of being uh, racist or having bad thoughts. And that's the part that I think we have to challenge. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Um, I was also sort of struck as I was reading the text about thinking about the opposite, right? So so we have multiple examples and your book gives so many incredible examples and I know you only scratched the surface. Of Jimmy all- Fa- like, so just in the 21st century, and this yeah. is a short list, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Sarah Silverman, um, three episodes of 30 Rock, <laughs> Saturday Night Live multiple times. Like you could not turn on late night television in the 21st century and not see blackface. In fact, I joke that you see more blackface than black performers. <laughs> Which is true, you do. <laughs> there is more blackface than black performers. <laughs> this is a 21st century. I'm not talking about the 19th century. <laughs> I know, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, I, I, I I don't know that I, I, I told you this, um, my first job, which was, you know, a little while ago, but not that long ago, I had a colleague who revealed to me that he had as recently as the 1970s performed blackface in in blackface. Um, and, and I mean that he would tell me that first of all, and then like tell it to me is like completely unashamed of having engaged in, in. So did that, do you think that he thought that this was a connection that you had? Uh, Possibly. I mean, I just written about it. I was thinking about it. So he, you know, let me know that, you know, he had, he had actually performed, performed in blackface. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that, that, um, has one of the things that happened is that um, in the U.S. that blackface minstrelsy with white actors blacking up shifted into blackface minstrelsy with black actors blacking up because black actors could do minstrelsy but they could only do it if they blacked up despite the yes. fact that they were already black they still had to put the makeup on and then that shifted into musical theater and vaudeville, and that vaudeville tradition lasted for a really long time. Into the initiation of talking pictures, yes. right? So the one of the first Academy Awards went to the jazz singer, yes. uh, which is uh, Al, Al Jolson. Jolson. Up. <laughs> but then there were Academy Award nominations for um, Swing Time, which has a, a minstrel performance, Babes mm-hmm. in Arms, which has like the history of the Academy Awards is a history of blackface being rewarded up to Robert Downey Jr. in 2008 in Tropic Thunder getting an Academy Award nomination for his blacked up performance. He only lost because you know who won that year, 2008? Heath Ledger. Right. <laughs> Posthumously. Posthum- um, and then in 2012 at the Academy Awards, uh, Billy Crystal was the host and he had a skit in which he blacked up to be um, Sammy Davis Jr. in 2012. Yeah. 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 So the Academy Awards and, and me are not in love. <laughs> <laughs> we're not, we're not close. <laughs> they, they have a long way to go. Way to go. Um, and it, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the, the Robert Downey Jr. When I first saw that advertised, I was like, I, I think my jaw hit the desk. I, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. They're really going to do a, well, really? Gonna... So I never saw it because I just, I just couldn't do that. 
Yeah, so, well, go. Yeah, I'll just say that I think uh, the director of that film, Ben Stiller, I think he had been working himself up to a full blackface uh, comedy routine because he flirts with it in Zoolander as well. When Zoolander goes back to visit his family in West Virginia, or no, I forget where it is, in New Jersey, the New Jersey coal mines. <laughs> And he goes, he's like, oh, I'm giving up uh, being a model and I'm going to work in the coal mines with my family. And he's like lifting tiny pieces of coal, exhausted and doing the catwalk. And then all of a sudden he like springs up in full on blackface. And his father says, what the hell's wrong with you? (laughs) So I'm thinking that Ben Stiller was actually thinking a lot about blackface through his career. And then he got he got Robert Downey Jr. to do that in, in 2008 in Tropic Thunder. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also really interesting to me that so much of it happens in, in the mo in the realm of comedy. And that's the thing that, that really sort of pokes a hole in this, the, the idea of the celebratory is that it's often in comedy, which is so that it becomes the butt of the joke. It's, 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 it's Absolutely. what makes it funny. Absolutely. And it is about power, right? Like who gets to yeah. tell that joke and yeah. who is the butt of the joke, as you say. So I actually, yeah, it's interesting to think, although Othello performances are still the one kind of tragic uh, realm in which blackface has been used um, recently, in particular in the operas, um, although the Met declared just a few years ago that they would no longer do that, so. Well, it's, it's about time for the, for the Met to say no more. It no only blackface. takes hundreds of years. <laughs> does it does um i was also thinking about whiteface and how we have blackface but we don't typically see actors of color putting on whiteface even though as you point out in your book you know megan kelly says you know you know people of color are dressed up in whiteface at halloween and i was like no we don't no. <laughs> that no it's not a, it's not a perf- i mean there are uh, at you know, one of my favorite movies is White Chicks, so I will put that out there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. A brilliant <laughs> film. Um, and Eddie Murphy famously has done some, some white yes. face routines. But it is not a performance tradition that ba- Black people or people of color in general feel that they are entitled to mm-hmm. or can use as a way to celebrate white culture. <laughs> And certainly in white, white chicks, for example, it is about, uh, and to talk about a very misogynistic film, I should, should put that out there that, yes. you know, yes, it is. Um, the, the humor is um, tied to the fact that it's all about mocking white women. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, there's something, something there about maybe there's a feeling of power over white women for those black men who created the movie, but um, I do think power is at the heart of racial impersonation. Yes. And gender impersonation. Yes. And racial racialized gender impersonation. Yes. Because yes. that's that's also that's also a thing. Which yes. is, you know, where those where those, you know, you know, even back to um, you know, Elizabethan stage, right? All of the performers were men. So all of those female roles were played by men who were boys who were dressed as women. Mm-hmm. Um and that tradition certainly has a, a a kind of female impersonation, but female impersonation does become does play a bigger role and does become a sort of like a staple of the the blackface minstrelsy. Um, yes, where all the the you know the black female roles were played by white men, cross dressed yes. and in blackface. So yes, yes, yeah. yes. and even to even to extending into the world of the radio show in my my the the work that I just finished I I talk a lot about or part of the first chapter is actually on the Buell show and when the Buell show was a radio show it featured two white men one white man who was playing Beulah who's essentially blacking up on the radio so he doesn't have to actually put the makeup on but he's putting on that persona of this this black woman made named Beulah um and we see this just, you know, continued again into the 21st century with um, animated shows, yes. um, most famously The Simpsons with Apu uh, voiced by uh, a white male actor. Um, but then there were Kristen Bell and several other um, white actors have said they will no longer do voices of characters that are not their race. 
Um, so I think that there, it, it's a moment where people are realizing, okay, maybe that's not, maybe I'm not allowed to own that performance. Maybe I need to think about whose who's jokes these should be, or maybe those people wouldn't want those jokes. Maybe we'd have to rewrite the shows. <laughs> but I think that ties exactly back to the, the radio plays that you were talking about. Yes, definitely. Um, so the other thing that I, I took and, and will probably use, citing you, of course, um, are these different modes. And so this is this is a part of your conversation about the virtuosity and, and the access that Black actors do or don't have to the label of virtuoso, mm -hmm. um, which I know is important for you and is also something that I've been very interested in. And so you talk about these different performance modes, minstrelsy slash imitation, exhibition slash trauma, and anxiety slash authenticity. So I wondered if we could just talk about those a little bit and we can sort of talk about how, how those three modes really inhibit some of the options for black actors. Absolutely. And I think that was, again, going back to like why I wrote this book was that it was really important for me to be able to set up an argument about why black actors aren't labeled as virtuosos and why they aren't given roles um, that allow them to have some sort of shape-shifting ability, um, why, they, why they, and kind of get typecast into very um, small segments of, of stereotypes. Um, so I think in the, in the first category of um, imitation and, and, and minstrelsy, I put a lot of <laughs> comedians, and I know, I know you're laughing because I rag on Tyler Perry so hard <laughs> in this book because I'm like, that's a straight up minstrel show. It's just that it was written and produced by you and you're getting all the money. But it is, it hits, he, and I did not come up with this phrase, um, but another scholar did, calls it fat suit minstrelsy. And that's what it is. It's fat suit minstrelsy. It's the same thing. Um, so that's one mode. And you see that qu quite a bit for, in particular for uh, Black male comics, I would say, or comedians, comic actors. Um, mm -hmm. Eddie Murphy does a lot of that kind of what I would call minstrelsy or <laughs> what um, Spike Lee calls coonery buffoonery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the second mode of trauma exhibition, I talk about 12 Years a Slave. Uh, and I, I, I very specifically picked uh, films that were written and produced by Black artists um, because I wanted to. I wanted to make it clear that even when we have the chance to make something, and when we have the chance to green light something, that we're falling into certain performance traditions that are not as empowering as they could or should be, and certainly don't allow the virtuosity that white actors um, are given. And so in this trauma exhibition mode of performance, it's all about a, a kind of traumatized body, a traumatized person, um, and their bodies often like exposed and their whipped back is shown. And, um, and the camera is usually assumed to be a kind of white gaze allowing you to see the trauma. And to me, that's not really an empowering stance. I didn't think 12 Years a Slave. I don't know what you thought of it. I did not like it. Couldn't watch it. it I, I, again, right. It's, it's the, the, mm. the trauma of it. And I, I have to like get myself up to be able to watch something that I feel is, is going to be that kind of Lisa, traumatic. Movie. I had to wait months and months and months until it was on cable. And my family went out for the day. I might've, I, maybe they were gone for the weekend or something. And I sat home and I was like, okay, I'm going to watch this. Cause I feel like I should, I tell you, it was a hard watch. It was a hard, hard watch because that is just not, I just don't want that. And was I surprised that that was up for all those Academy Awards? No. No, no. no. That performance no. mode will get you an Oscar nomination every time. If you're traumatized, naked, brutalized, sh shoved in a box, raped, you know, all these things, Halle Berry's Halle Berry. Oscar. Yes. <laughs> Monsters. All the, there's a whole 
thing. And you know exactly what I'm talking about if you've yep. watched any films. Yeah, uh, Denzel the Washington. Years. Denzel, yeah. I mean, all these different roles that Denzel's played and he gets nominated for what? You know, <laughs> right? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then the third mode I call um, authenticity anxiety. <laughs> and I, I think a lot about like... Um, Kenya Barris's work and how he is, he's just constantly being like, am I black? Is this black? Is this bad black? Is this good black? What am I like? And I think that's, that's not necessarily a new performance mode. I think it's one that a lot of black artists have struggled with for the last, you know, 200 years. Um, thinking about like, what can I actually do that allows me to be a real black person? And does that even exist in a performance mode? And I'm not saying that black people don't know how to be black people in their lives. We do, we all do. Right. But once you get into film or on stage or on television, it's a different thing. Just it's, something goes wrong. And so I'm, I'm interested in, in that mode probably more than the other two, but even that feels quite limiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will definitely, I'm actually thinking of you know, like, boy, I want to use these because <laughs> I think that they're, um, they're so insightful in, in terms of really kind of nailing down what is available to people and the, the limits and the fact that even when we, we have, even when we sort of own the means of production, right? Even That's when you're the ones doing the producing and doing the writing, we still fall into some of these same tropes and, and the questions about how to, you know, how to represent blackness on the screen or on the stage. And, you know, those remain questions after all this time. And I think you really sort of like, like get right to it it's it's this question of like well what's authentically black is, this, is it black enough you know well and and the reason that the book goes back to the early modern period to Shakespeare's time is that I wanted to make it clear that um to be a black character on stage to be a black character that's performed was white property from the beginning and once that's the established mode from the 1600s on, what happens when you're Kenya Barish in 2020? Well, then you worry about how to perform your own self authentically on film. Like that's the, mm -hmm. like you're combating 400 years of history of white people owning black performance, literally owning black performance. Yes. That's, that's the whole thing thrust of the book so you don't have to read it but you all should go out and buy it, <laughs> <read> it anyway. <laughs> um yeah i was just, i'm sort of like looking at some of the things um i wanted to sort of to, to go back with you to, to sort of take that trip back in history and you know i think it's really important and you know your work has done this over the years to really kind of point out the the fallacy that the early modern period in Europe was all white when it was not. <laughs> yeah, and I think this, is, and um, there's been great new archival work that's come out in the last 20 years um, that shows that both medieval London and, and, you know, major cities in Europe and Renaissance London and major cities in Europe were not all white. They just weren't. We now have all these archival evidence documents about all these different people from different countries, different religions. They were metropolitan centers that were trying to engage in a, in a global uh, trading scheme. And so when you think about Shakespeare writing plays at a theater that he called The Globe, he's actually, he might have been looking out to an audience that was diverse. And certainly when I was studying Shakespeare at Dog's age ago, that was not the narrative we were told. In fact, I remember very distinctly my Shakespeare professor saying he would never have known any Jews. There were no Jews in England because they had been expelled. And so all of these characters that you're claiming are racialized are not really racialized because he's just imagining them. 
And I was like, well, A, I think you can imagine it and have it be racialized. And B, that's just not what the archives tell us anymore. So I think that's an important uh, thing to realize and to think about what's ha what happened on in those plays that Shakespeare wrote and the way that Shakespeare's plays have become the center of our literary canon, even 400 years later, um, that's important to realize like what's ha what's going on around race here a lot. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I wanted to think about some of the other things that I, that, that really struck me. Um, Virtuosity. I did want to ask you about virtuosity. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually wanted to ask you if you thought that, if you think that there are contemporary Black actors who you would call virtuoso. Well, so it depends on how we define virtuoso. And so okay. again, like I think in, in our, in acting critics, minds who are, and by the way, they're almost all white men. There are a few white women who are, you know, theater and television and film critics, but by and large is a white male industry. Um, for them, virtuosity is often tied to this shape-shifting. And for example, uh, Manola Dargis and A.O. Scott came out with their list of the top 25 actors of the 21st century. So 25 actors of the last 20 years. And um, there were a lot of actors of color on the list. And in fact, Denzel Washington tops their list, but they call him charismatic. <clears throat> Tilda Swinton, who's at number 13, is called a radical shapeshifter and a virtuoso. <laughs> and that's, and, and so then I went, I read their article like eight times and I was like, what's happening here? And you could see every actor of color, the adjective used for them was charismatic. So Sonia Braga, charismatic. Mahershala Ali, charismatic. Denzel Washington, charismatic. The white actors are never called charismatic, never, and are frequently discussed like um, Tilda Swinton and, um, oh my God, uh, Nicole Kidman for their ability to adopt any character and to erase themselves. And I think that idea that an actor erases him or herself and into a role is about whiteness. That's whiteness. <laughs> and so I, so would I call some actors of color virtuosos? Yes, but in the way that I would define virtuosity different. Um, and so that's why I hesitate. What, what, how do you define virtuosity and, and, and so who would you lump in? So, you know, I'm, I was thinking about this and I think about it in terms of, of actor skill um, and to some extent, right, that ability to um, to fully embody a role. And that may be different than the kind of idea of a shapeshifter, um, but really a, an actor who does that actor study so that they have created for themselves the whole history of the character in they, their body, in mm -hmm. their body. So, yeah, that so they, who they, would you, who would you say is that? So, cause I'd be curious to hear. So, um, so I think Denzel Washington is one of those. No, and I would, I would, I would, <laughs> <No. laughs> see, <laughs> You know what? You know, I think about. I something. think he only ever plays Denzel. He, really? He, there's never any physical change. There's never embodiment. His okay. acting's all in his jaw. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so perhaps um, Viola Davis. See, I think she has the potential to be labeled virtuoso. I do think. I think she has a remarkable craft. I actually think Mahershala Ali has immense craft. But I, I think craft, this is what I think is what I'm trying to, this will be the next book. So this is not exactly in this in Black Facebook. Right, but, but I think it's hard for white people to identify craft in actors of color 
because for them, craft is only visible through whiteness and through a whiteness that is able to put on prosthetics. So whether that's a fake nose or lightening the skin, darkening the skin, whatever. And this is not something that like actors of color don't often use prosthetics aside from wigs. Right. Aside from wigs. So uh, that's something I want. I like, that's another, maybe that's just an article I need to write. Like what actors of color get to use prosthetics? Use prosthetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I agree with you on Mahershala Ali. I, I think he is just a, I think he's a brilliant actor. He really is. The incredibly uh, brilliant. Craft, craft, craft. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean. But so that's, that's not how they talk about his acting though. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I would have to just disagree with them. On that. And I may have to agree, disagree with, you know, some of their other actors that they talk about as sort of, you know, disappearing into character that I'm not, I'm not so sure that they do. I'm mm-hmm. not so sure that, that, that that's necessarily, mm-hmm. um, I, I watched something with Nicole Kidman recently and I, there's a way in which she's, she's, for me, she's always present. I mean, there, there are times when, you know, when you're watching someone and you sort of forget the, the, the palimpsest of all of their, their previous roles, mm-hmm. they're not all written on there. And, and, and that's, that's what I think many people think about Meryl Streep too, that like you can see her craft, but only because she allows, she wants you to see her, with her craft. <laughs> yes. So, and I think that's true. I think that's true of Nicole Kidman too. Yeah. We are going far afield from blackface here, but I like it. We are a little bit, a little bit. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I sort of mentioned a little bit, um, the, the fact of, of black actors having to put on blackface in order to perform mm-hmm. minstrelsy. Um, and so sort of wanted to sort of talk this, toss that out and sort of get your, get your thoughts on that. Yeah. And actually, I don't know if you know that there, uh, the earliest like kind of scholarly histories of minstrelsy tried to claim that it was, a, <laughs> that black people created it and that white people just imitated it. And I like, <laughs> so yeah. then there was like a whole, like a whole having to undo that, those facts um, for a while and to say, actually, no, <laughs> white, white people created this and then black people to have a way into the industry of acting, um, uh, appropriated it for themselves. But the idea, I think that you're, you're hitting on that black people would have to put on makeup to perform this stereotype of blackness tells you everything you need to know about why Black actors continue to have a hard time um, performing Blackness now, right? In a way that doesn't fall into these these weird stereotypes. So I do think that that's, it's so toxic. And that, that, that history and that legacy is something we need to break. And I, and I will say like, it comes up every Halloween uh, when people, and a lot of, a lot of students at university campuses Um, will don um, (laughs) a costume that enables them then to do a cross-racial impersonation, whether it's a Native American or an African American or Latinx or Asian. Uh, And I think in that moment, people feel like it's um, everything's okay. There's a license to do everything. Um, but that's probably the moment when you need to say, if I do this, or if my friends do this, this is tapping into this longer history and is really making it hard for people of color to perform themselves. <laughs> um, so maybe I shouldn't do this. <laughs> so I'll just say that because it literally every year, every Halloween, there are news stories about students on campuses in blackface for their costumes. Yes, there are. Absolutely. <laughs> it's surprising. I, even today, I, I, I still am. Um, it, and it, is it just that people don't know? Well, so I think it's two things. I think it's not like there's ever a moment in your high school where you're taught about minstrelsy. 
And it's not like there's many opportunities in your college classes, unless they're taking classes with you or me, to learn about minstrelsy either. And so I think it is fair to think that someone can get to be a 22-year-old and older and never have heard about this history. And then there's a way of saying, I didn't know, and so I'm innocent. Um, I will say that most Black people know this history because they've had to be made aware of it, because they've encountered these moments where their white friends or their white classmates show up in Blackface to a party or to an event or whatever. And then they're like, I think then there's a moment where they're, they will ask their friends or family or their social network how this happens. And then someone will be like, oh, don't you know about minstrelsy? So part of the, the reason I wrote this book, and it's short, it's really short. You can sit down and read it pretty quickly. Um, and it's in an accessible fashion, I hope, is that I'm hoping people can just say like, oh, this is what, this is how it happens. This is why it happens. And here's why it needs to stop. That's really so that you that you can hand this book to your friends after Halloween and be like, this is why it was problematic. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. <laughs> or before Halloween, maybe. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking about another example that I that was um, that was that hit me very profoundly. And this was this was a long time ago, so I'm probably dating myself, but that's OK. Um, cause I don't look it. So it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember when, do you remember when Ted Danson? Yes, I do with Whoopi. Go- yes, I do. Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, you'll have to explain. Cause there are, our, 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 our yeah, students both. won't know these references. <laughs> references. And I'm trying to remember what, what it was. I know it was, it, it, it was, was a, a roast. It was a roast. Okay. Cause I was like, was it an award show? It wasn't an award show. It was a roast. And so Ted Danson, shows up he dating Whoopi Goldberg at the time so he's he's a white American actor yes and and, you know, and dating a black female actor actor right and you know he's the good place for people who've seen the good place that Ted Danson that one um shows up in blackface um and you know some people were a little surprised and I I, I was just I was dumbstruck and that Whoopi was with him and that Whoopi was with him. that's the part I think that I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but I think that's the part that was hard because in mm-hmm. some ways he was acting as if, of course, he's not racist. And of course he couldn't be racist because he's dating this amazing black woman. And so because he's dating this amazing black woman, which proves that he's not racist, then he's allowed to do this horrible race. And like, and when Lisa says blackface, he had on the whole like lips. R- the lips, like he looked like this, the like cover that. of the book. Yes. And so uh, the that was what was so painful. And I, I remember, and I think that's probably when I learned about blackface from, well, I had seen some of those um, uh, Judy Garland movies where there were black. And I was always like, what the heck is this? Cause my mother loved those old musicals. And so we wa- watched a lot of those. And there was always like a moment where I would get creeped out. <laughs> so, white Christmas. You, that, that's, there's a scene in white Christmas that's called minstrel show. They don't put on makeup, but they do a minstrel routine. Mm-hmm. And I remember like, just instinctively hating that movie and not knowing why for a long time. And then when I was writing this book, I was like, oh, that's why. (laughs) But yeah, so I think that that Ted Danson moment just was like, it was so, it was like the horror and why she didn't stop him, why she kind of, her presence like kind of (laughs) enabled him to do this. Yes. Yes. So I, yeah, it was a, it was a, one of those sort of gut punch moments for mm-hmm. me. That I was aghast that, that he would do it and that she would stand next to him while he was doing it. And um, yeah, just surprising. So um, you, you end your book with um, not quite end it, but get close to the end with um, talking about Kenan Thompson and uh, a Saturday night live skit where he says, um, you know, no, no more blackface. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> no more black face. No more black face. Um, so I hope that we can get to a place, maybe in part because of your your book, that we, we are at no more black face. Thank you. Yeah. So we have some questions from our, some of our students. Um, and so I will, um, let's turn over to some of these student questions. So the first question comes from Bailey Shaw. Bailey, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Oh, thank you so much, um, Lisa. And thank you so much, Ayana, for being here and speaking to us today. Um, my name is Bailey Shaw. I'm a second year elementary education major here at ASU. Um, and my question for you is, um, in your book, it seems as though individuals lack exposure to the correct way to address blackface and other instances of racial injustice. Um, and they often rely on that, that white innocence logic to defend themselves after the fact. And like they fail to consider that um, and the consequences of that beforehand. So how might we begin to introduce the, the correct and respectful way to both understand the history behind this, but also advocate for anti-racism early on? Um, and where do you think this process starts? Oh, Bailey, that's such a good question. And, um, you know, I actually think, especially since you're, you're studying education, I think it would be great in like the month of October in schools to have that be a moment where teachers inform their students of this history and the implications and, that, and tie it to like costumes that are available. And it's really easy to do searches. Like, for example, Cleopatra costumes. <laughs> Right. I mean, there are a whole host of like costumes that invite uh, a type of cross-racial impersonation that that can be very damaging. So I think that might be a great um, way to open up this history. Like if we could lean into October as like the no blackface month <laughs> that then culminates in a Halloween that doesn't have blackface would be pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> Definitely. That's a good point. And that's something that, I mean, those younger students, they don't even realize that is a problem, right? So what a, what a great opportunity to sort of bring that to light. Um, I love that response. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your book. It's such an important topic that I don't think is talked about enough. So thank you for your work and I'll, I'll hand it over to the next student. <laughs> thank you so much, Bailey. <laughs> okay. So next up is Madison Stollard. I hope I got your last name correct. Yeah. I just want to... I want to just say how much I love ASU students and how amazingly smart they are. So Thanks. <laughs> I love you, ASU students. <laughs> um, well, hello, my name is Madison and I'm also an education major. So I am in my second year studying secondary education with an emphasis of history. So I specifically want to teach U.S. history. So it's really important to me that I get the history of African Americans and minorities in general correct when I'm teaching students because it's something that I didn't necessarily get correct until I was in college. Um, so I just wanna be a part of that, that change. But my question for you is as a student studying history, I've heard the back then sort of explanation too many times. Um, and it's frustrating for me when I hear it. Um, and it, I realized this year, actually, that I was taught about the civil rights movement in particular and racism in a, in a back then narrative <laughs> when I was in school, that it didn't exist um, anymore, which obviously we, we know that is not true. Um, and so my question is, how do you recommend that we begin kind of overcoming that narrative, specifically as educators? Like, how do we communicate properly with students that this is not something that's in the past. Um, keeping in mind that we are sort of stuck in these little political and, you know, curriculum boxes. So we can't necessarily voice a lot of our own political opinions, but um, it's still obviously a conversation that has to be had. So I just wanted to know what your recommendations were for having those conversations. <laughs> oh, Madison, that's such a great question because, so I have an 18 year old son and a 10 year old daughter. And my 10 year old told me <laughs> that, you know, she always raises her hand in class and the teacher never calls on her. And then suddenly in black history month, the teacher was all over her. And the, <laughs> what she wanted my daughter to say was, so there was racism in the past, but you haven't experienced it, have you? And my daughter was like, oh, what? <laughs> she's like, I don't have my hand up. <laughs> so, but that was the precisely a back then moment, like racism's over and I need you black child to validate all of us as being good people. Um, so 
that's not the way to do it, <laughs> I would say. Um, but I think a, a, a probably a more, a, a good way to combat that is to sometimes they, and I think in, I learned from an education specialist that you have to acknowledge pro, prior knowledge. So you do an exercise where you're like, tell me everything you think you know about X period. And um, Dean Cohen and I, in fact, did this in a class that we team taught about myths of Britain. And we were like, what do you think you know about women in the medieval world? And they came up with all this crazy stuff that was from Game of Thrones. Like it was, you know, it was like fiction, fiction, but you just let them voice all their prior knowledge. And then, and then, because I guess some of the science of learning is that you, it's very hard to acquire new knowledge unless your old knowledge has been voiced, even if you don't have to debunk it, but you can get them to voice it and say, right, so some of this will touch on and some of this um, you'll see maybe be, will be challenged in the information as we go forward. So I think that's probably one strategy that I would use is like have people tell voice to the class what they think they know about Reconstruction, the civil rights era, whatever, pick whatever historical moment you're teaching and then include, then move forward with like, you know, a, a, an alternative set of facts that they can then build on. I love that. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm definitely going to take that with me um, soon in the future when I'm in my own classroom. But I, now that I think about it, that's something that I actually got the chance to do this year in a class. And I think it did really help. So it does. Uh, like, And I, I have to say, when I heard this from my, an education specialist that I work with, Laura Turchi, I was highly skeptical because I was like, you don't want all this false stuff floating around in your classroom. I don't want to spread lies about Shakespeare or whatever. And she's like, I'm telling you, this is what the science tells us about how people begin to learn. Like you have to have that out there. And then you, and you don't have to like debunk it all. You can say, huh, that's interesting. You know, we may not all agree about this. Let's see what, where the facts take us going forward. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great way to give the students like voice, but also approach the fact that they might not be 100% correct or also incorporate their own perspectives as well in a very sort of educational way that's not like let's just focus on these specific students and their specific story let's give Rep everyone a chance Re represent all black people 10 year old <laughs> child <laughs> all right well thank you so much I really appreciate it thanks so much Madison Jay Romero you're up Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah, unmute yourself. Oh, he is unmuted, but your sound's not working. Let's see. Nope. Oh, no, Jay. <laughs> Hopefully, Jay will come back to us. Do we have, um, do we have a different student? Yes. Um, Jenna. Jenna Simon? Simon? Hi. Hi. Um, so I, my name is Jenna. I am also, I'm a secondary education major with an emphasis in English. Um, so your, the part in your book where you were talking about um, Shakespeare uh, was really interesting to me because I know that there's a lot of controversy, not over just the use of blackface, but like he invented all these words, but he really he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. He really um, didn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I guess my question for you is like, what do you think about him still being taught in schools? And if he is like how to address his use of blackface? I absolutely think Shakespeare should still be taught. And let me say that to all the right wing media that it last month <laughs> like attacked me as part of trying to cancel Shakespeare. I was like, me? Cancel Shakespeare? My whole career is built on Shakespeare. <laughs> However, <laughs> let's acknowledge why Shakespeare is the center of our literary curriculum. That was part of an imperial endeavor. English literature as a field was born in imperial India. And the British were saying, oh, we need to make the Indians more like us let's teach them Shakespeare. <laughs> and so that's how literature as a field came about. 
So that doesn't mean I want to cancel Shakespeare by acknowledging that history, but I think it's important to know that history. But in terms of how we can teach Shakespeare in an inclusive or anti-racist fashion, um, just like I think now it's pretty common for teachers to reveal that the female parts were played by boy actors. I think it's probably important to say, and the black char characters were not black people, they were white people in makeup. And so what does, how does that impact the way we understand the plays? How does that impact the way we understand all the racial references in the plays? Because let's be clear, almost every play has a racial reference, Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, et cetera, et cetera. There's always like a joke about blackness being ugly. Um, and uh, like Juliet is compared to uh, Rosalind and, and it's like, oh, Rosalind's as ugly as a black crow and Juliet is, you know, gorgeous as an, I forget what, uh, a white dove or something like that. So I think that that's empowering for students once you get them to see that language and that that language is a kind of part of a racial epistemology that helped create um, the racial categories that we're kind of still stuck in today. That does not mean I want to cancel Shakespeare though. <laughs> Okay, Fox News. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's uh, helpful and um, enlightening as a future teacher. Thanks, Jenna. <laughs> people, people don't understand. We love Shakespeare. Okay. Love Shakespeare. <laughs> you know, you could critique something and still love it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So Jay, can you get your microphone working? If not, I'd like to read Jay's questions for Ionis. Let's see. Jay, can you can we hear you? I believe you can now. Yay! But we awesome. can't see you, but we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Something yeah. has to go wrong, but at least you can hear my voice. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming out here, Dr. Ayanna Thompson. Um, it's always a pleasure to learn from people who have been in this field for a long time, and I think it's absolutely critical to the work that we do um, and, and absolutely tantamount to moving forward. Um, I'm Jay Romero, um, and special surprise, I'm actually the fourth education major here to round up the group. So I'm well, I just want to say uh, education majors are kicking butt. You guys are amazing on point. <laughs> yeah, I'm secondary education English, um, personally. Um, and my first question is, so in blackface, you bring up many historical accounts of the way that blackface has occurred in popular media, especially in contemporary media, but also taking note of its historical roots. In the past few years, few recent years, uh, we've seen sort of a dichotomy in how publishing companies take on addressing content. Cont oh, Jay, no. Mornings before the. Oh, okay, you're back. Keep going. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, on one hand, Disney on one hand includes a negative includes four warnings before their older media that says like this program includes a negative depictions and or mistreatment of people and cult cultures rather than remove this. We want to acknowledge it, acknowledge that it's harmful, learn from it and spark a conversation to create a more inclusive future for all. On the other hand, I'm sure everyone remembers the Sousa state recently um, who completely halted the production sale of I think I saw it on Mulberry Street and if I ran the zoo. In your estimation, which of these two strategies when applied to prior media that include, included blackface is best for navigating discussions of racial and ethnic stereotyping moving forward, or is it a different answer entirely? Do we pull away completely and say, absolutely not, no more, can't have that content, or do we include it and include forewarnings um, and, and measurements of warning? Oh, Jay, man, a killer question, um, because I'll add to the Disney, like the, the three episodes of 30 Rock that included blackface have been pulled entirely. Um, and Tina Fey said, I don't want to be responsible for any child who is looking for laughs to be traumatized. So that's sort of along the Dr. Seuss line. I'm going to, I think I'm on the Disney side though, like I like that warning. <laughs> and, and I in particular do not like the idea of whitewashing a past or erasing something. Now I do want to have the heads up. And so this I think aligns with what Lisa and I were saying about 12 years a slave that like neither of us really wanted to see it and she still hasn't seen it. So <laughs> 
and I watched it and felt traumatized by it. So like, you know, at least I knew going in if that, if it, if that had been a comedy and then switched into this trauma mode, it would have been hard. Um, but I think with the, with the forewarning, it's pretty smart. And, and then I think allows people to make a decision, but also keeps the historical record there. And for me, as someone who deals with the past, archives are really, really important. And I am not really for scrubbing an archive. I'm really for preserving an archive. And in fact, I like the way that Disney phrases it about like sparking a conversation. Um, So I'm definitely on the Disney side only for this statement because actually I hate Disney otherwise. (laughs) I have to agree with you there. That is 100% true. Um, And then I suppose as a follow-up question, this the previous question dealt specifically with media, and I know that Blackface is a book, um, talks specifically about media usage and the ways that this sort of unplays or um, happens on quote unquote Hollywood. But in ultimatum, who would you say, whose responsibility is it to upturn this work and continue to make progress towards showing students that this is not okay, that um, future students can't dot Blackface? Is this teachers? Is this parents? Is it government officials? Is it actors and directors or all the above? Who, whose job is it in society? Well, I, I wouldn't want it to be government officials, <laughs> uh, but that was interesting. Th- interesting thought too, like make blackface illegal. <laughs> uh, but um, I think it is parents, teachers, uh, communities. Uh, I think that that has to be the site of, of change. Um, I do notice with my children who are both Gen Z, one at the like kind of uh, older end and one at the younger end of Gen Z, that they learn from their peer groups the most. So like podcasts, YouTube videos, TikTok, et cetera. It would be great if there were content on there about the history of blackface and why um, they sh- we should all consider not doing that moving forward. Because I think that would probably be the largest change agent as opposed to me writing a book. I should have made a TikTok. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, the community, parents, teachers, community, that's where I would put the, the onus. I appreciate that response so much, Dr. Thompson. I, that was fantastic. I appreciate your time and, and all of your work. I appreciate those questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that's all of our student questions. So have we come to the end of our discussion? Come to the end of our discussion. I wanted to give you an opportunity to just sort of um, give us any parting words you might have for us other than read my book. (laughs) (laughs) I believe it's on sale on Amazon. (laughs) No, I want to say, I want to quote Kenan Thompson. No, no more blackface. (laughs) That's where I think we should end. (laughs) All right. So I would like to uh, thank a few folks. Um, I'd like to thank the Tomorrow Talks series. Um, I would like to thank Bruce Matsugana and Kristen LaRue who have been backstage, uh, making sure that all of this has come out without a hitch. Um, I would like to thank Dean Jeffrey Cohen for his continued support and Professor Kyle Jensen for coming up with the idea. Great. Thank you to all of our student panelists and thank you to Dr. Ayanna Thompson for the gift of your book and the gift of your time and the gift of your knowledge. Thank you, Lisa. It was such a pleasure to talk to you and it makes me realize like, I wish we talked every day. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we can make that happen. (laughs) Yes. And students, please be in touch if you have any questions about Blackface or history of, of performing Blackness. Um, or if you want to talk about virtuosity, I would love to talk to with you all about that. So, so thank you all.